This is Trumps, but it's an unusual Trumps. So firstly, let me tell the non-execs who are sitting here, and there's one, two, three, four, five of our non-exec directors sitting here, and thank you for joining us. I think it's the first Trumps you guys have ever been at. We do this once every month or so, and it's this kind of session. People sit at the tables, they eat a bit of food, they talk and they laugh, hopefully, and we tell them a bit about business, and that we have a draw for competition. I think most of them, if I'm honest, come from the draw. <laughs> some for the food. Um, a little, so the other they have to listen to us a bit. So. Um, but I think this time it's different because we've got here um, the normal draws, but then we are going to talk about uh, one of our non-execs, and then she's going to make a presentation to us. And her name is Tandrina Global, but I won't get into that yet. First let me just explain to you, uh, we've had these kind of meetings before, and I'll tell you all about our um, business and how it's doing, and how we work with our non-execs and the shareholders. And I can only tell you, and I say it in front of them, and I promise you I'm not sucking up, because I do say it to them openly, and I know David agrees with me, as does Sarah, Sean, and Doug that we could never, ever, ever do our jobs in the way we do if it wasn't for the team of non-execs that we work with. They were unbelievably committed. And they, most of them have been involved in our business for a long time, and even the newish ones um, have instantly become part of our uh, governance and business in a, in a unique way. Um, so when Sarah said to me uh, about three months ago, you know, Tandy, who she knows well, as I do, has been on our board since 2001, and that means it's 17 years, and has been intricately involved, believe it or not, in all, lot, so many things many of you don't even know about, but all of the ones that you do, and has helped me and our board through lots of different stuff. And she said that people don't even know her or it, so why don't we ask her and maybe in time the other non-execs to say a few words. <coughs> so that's how we are here for Tandy. Um, just to introduce Tandy, because then we'll go straight to that, and then we're going to have a bit more of the normal stuff. Uh, maybe I should quickly talk about business. Business is okay, not bad, all of the same. Tandy, not any bad, accounts going, life is okay. <laughs> Work hard. So now, Tandy. Tandy, our work, I was on the board with Tandy in the old rule tree. Uh, this is in 19, oh God, I don't know what's so probably about 1996, 7 or somewhere like that. And um, already I, I was amazingly impressed. So when I was able to persuade her to join our board in 2001, um, I was thrilled when she decided to accept. And I genuinely cannot tell you how many times we've had lots of really serious challenges on our board. Governance, criticism in the press, you know what. And Tandy has always been to me personally a mentor and to many of our staff uh, an, an amazing uh, person to work with. I always say to her, and I know that's true, if ever you want to know the definition of brand ambassador, and I mean that in your veins, and if you want that, I always say to you, in this question, if you why are you here? Because she is the epitome of a truest brand ambassador. She <laughs> understands it. You don't have to explain it to her. She doesn't have to sign any contracts. She is a brand ambassador of truest in the true sense of the word. If anyone says anything bad about truest, she defends it. If she gets hurt and angry, she loves talking to Sarah and Doug about the merchandise and if she's got a problem, she tells them and she tells me. So behind the scenes, Tandy, we really, really value you. Um, just to tell you about Tandy, um, she was born in Soweto um, 46 years ago.
she was schooled at Orlando High School. She obtained a degree in open, uh, academic excellence and she participated in many student organizations. I said it as a joke earlier that today one of our other non execs Roddy Spots, quite a serious guy, and I said, as Roddy always says, which is completely untrue because he's never said it, uh, Tandy is a woman of mysteries. And although Roddy never said it and got a shock when I said that, it's the truth, because you'll feel that now when I've told you a bit more about her. So she was she was the student Christian movement representative. Christian Movement Representative. She was the founding member actually. And now at the height of the student uprisings in 1976, she was serving as the Administrative Secretary of the SRC, Student Representative Council, University of Forte. But she had a tragedy. Her baby brother passed away. Um, she then had to abandon her Bachelor of Science degree because of uh, the impression of sorry I'm She spent the next couple of years, now I'm going to start feeding the mystery part of it, in training within the rank of Mkondi Siseswe, the military wing of the National ANC. In 1976, she was part of the contingent of NKKers who were posted to Novo Katengwa, a military camp in, camp in Angola. She served as a senior political commissioner charged with running literacy and education programs with, uh, with a thousand of the recruits. She also was, believe it or not, a commander of the military wing, and she will tell you she was a tank commander. We're talking about a fighter. <laughs> In 1978, she was sent to the Union of Social, the Soviet Union, for further training. She was then in 1979 sent to the ANC headquarters in Lusaka and she served the ANC in various capacities including admin secretary of the women's section and in 1984 she enrolled with the University of Zambia getting a BSc degree in human biology and an MPCHB degree uh, at that same university. So she's highly qualified as a medical doctor. Um, I mean, that's quite a background, but that's not even the mystery part. <laughs> um, I feel I've left something out there. Why do I feel that? <laughs> I'm just proud to know you, so I don't want you. Okay, so then um, she was she she practiced medicine on Orange Farm, which was a settlement for very poor people for five years. She was the only doctor in the whole population of 200,000 people. And then in that time, she, now this part of this comes from a book which I've read from cover to cover, she started to get involved with, because she was worried about how people could live and the housing and, and the poor housing and she realized there was government funding available, so she went and became involved in, with, with some people, so I'm sure she'll tell you a bit about it, who were trying to help poor people with housing. And she started to get involved from a humanitarian point of view because she was already a doctor and she decided to help the people with housing. That started her property development company. And it's an interesting thing because, just as an example, she was awarded something that was, was it yesterday, the day before, last night. And just if I get it right, it's the South African Property Woman of the Year. Just so you need to know, I mean, if you read a book, Oliver Tambo, uh, all the famous ANC names, new, uh, Jacob Zuma, recommend, <laughs> <laughs> he recommended, I'm not finished, I'm not finished, you stay right there, but you know, they recommended her to go and study. 
I, I'm really pleased, but I have to say this last part. The, the, the other mystery, because none of you believe in this, but the other mystery, she, over the last couple of years, for charity events, she reached the summit of Mount Kenya, the second highest mountain on the African continent, in 2011. Then she reached the highest peak in the African continent, the Uhuru Peak on Mount Kilimanjaro. And in and then in last year she reached the base camp, no, 2014, the base camp and in um of, is that? I don't know where it is, but I don't know. <laughs> and then finally she went back, she wasn't, she hadn't enough, she climbed the summit of Kilimanjaro again in 2015. So now you know what I mean. Sunday, I know that was a long introduction, but you really deserve it. And nice to have you with us. Emotional for you, I'm sorry that I made you take an emotional <laughs> introduction. Um, but Michael and I come a long way, as he said. Um, in 2001, when I got the phone call from Michael that said, uh, Tandy, I'd like you to serve on my board, I was like, oh, yeah, this serious guy. <laughs> <laughs> like a girl, you know, being approached by the most handsome guy in the class. You know how you that uh, if you think I'm an inspiration to you, you really are an inspiration when I speak to young people who are developing businesses, I ask them to link themselves with people uh, of, of the highest degrees of ethics, morality, good leadership, good governance, and you always come up in my speeches. So thank you very much for being that guiding light. In the next 10 to 12 minutes, I, I want to leave you with a message. Um, I was asked to speak about what I've written in the book. So um, here's the challenge. If, if you really want to read the book, you need to write to me. So get Kathy or Sonia to give, my, to give you my email address and you write to me and I'll send you a copy of the book. And I thought just in this short period to summarize the book in a narrative that I've decided to call Activism for Self-Fulfillment and Pursuit of Social Justice. Because I just, when I look at my life, I, I just feel that maybe this activism was in pursuit, yes, of social justice in the end, but there was always this inner feeling in me to get personally fulfilled. And a very good friend of mine, I haven't met her, but I read her books because I love reading books, Ayanla. Ayanla talks about the fact that if you're not self-fulfilled, you cannot even think of helping the next person. Your cup must overflow so that you can share with others. If your cup is half empty, how can you even think of sharing it? So I suppose if I look at my life, what I've done has really been an attempt to be self-fulfilled and to have this abundance so that I can share it with other people. So bear that in mind. So last year, the award that I, last night, not last year, the award that I received is called the Lisa Blaine Award for Excellence in Leadership in the Property Sector and it's a Lifetime Achievement Award. I accepted the award because a few years ago I decided I'm not going to accept any more awards because really if you walk into my office, the space. <laughs> Really, I, I just I received many awards in my life, and I say to myself that if I if I accept awards, I'm blocking the path for other women to receive awards. But this one, when I received the citation, because it was the third year I've been asked by uh, Sapoa women to accept the award because it's not it's a nomination without competing with others, and finally I said, okay, send me the stuff. And I read about this woman who died few years ago from cancer, this Lisa Blaine, but what she did really touched me because she went out and said, what can I do? There's women in the property space. I, as a white woman, have been privileged to have what I have. She set up groups of young black women, educated them using her own means, 
and then went out to raise funding for them, took some of them to universities because she believed that education was at the core of what she could do to transform that industry. A week before that, I received yet another award, which I also didn't want to receive. It tricked me into coming to the event, but it was an award as a, uh, it was given by what is called FASE, South African Federation Forum of uh, Civil Engineering Contractors. It's within my industry. And so I, this subset, I'd actually been refusing to join because I'm like, I'm not going to join this group of uh, white males who are untransformed and, and, and all the good things we say about people. But um, when I got to the event, a colleague, Michael, um, uh, Mike Wine, had also been given a transformation award. So picture this, a white guy is being given an award for transformation and I'm getting an award for being a good leader. So I questioned that. I said to them, but I'm supposed to be the one getting the award for transformation. Why am I telling you these things? Okay, the year before, I, I was awarded a, a lifetime award again, achievement award by Women Chartered Accountants, an association of women chartered accountants. And I'm telling you, and I'm not an accountant, as you probably know, <laughs> the least I can do with accounting is to ask uh, Mike Thompson what things mean because he's each other accountant. But I'm telling you this because I want to go back to what is contained in my book. And it is about a mantra that I developed as a young girl. And if you don't have a mantra, you're sitting in this room today, please go home and think hard about mantra. What, what is it that I want to do? What is it that I want to leave as my legacy? Because you can't just be on this earth to be an oxygen thief. We call that oxygen thieves. So my mantra, mantra is really around living each and every day as if it were my last. And it's longer than most mantras because I want to incorporate all the things I want. And the next thing I say in my mantra is that I want to touch each soul that I encounter every day of my life. As I walk through the journey of life, each soul that I encounter, I should touch. Because after all, we are all made in the image of God. And so for me, the things that I did as a child and I'm continuing to do are really centered around the impact that I'd like to leave on the globe when I'm gone. So that the name Tadino translates into something tangible for human beings. And so, I took my childhood of poverty and deprivation. If I tell you the stories, you wonder why I still have, I can talk about them and laugh. For example, I would walk to school, leave at five in the morning, because I didn't have two cents to get off the school bus. No food for the whole day. And by the way, I was a little bit smart. I would be friends with kids from rich families. <laughs> But at the time I have something to eat. <laughs> Get back home and there's still nothing. And wait until my father, who was a school teacher, came home and hoped he would bring something. So I took that. The fact that I slept on a bed, which was meant to be a single bed, but five of us children in that home, three girls and two boys, slept on that bed. We called it the boat because at some point it was falling down. <laughs> and we put bricks underneath it. I moved from there to a position where I decided I am not going to allow my circumstances to dictate who I am. So I am going to change them. And changing them meant I studied like it was getting out of fashion. And so my academic excellence that Michael spoke about was not because I was a smart kid, but I would study from day one until at the end of in my Form 1 June exams, the principal said, no, no, we can't waste this child's time. She must go to Form 2, so I did two classes in one year. And half the time I was starving as I was doing that. Went to Forte, as Mike said, did what I did in Forte, because at the back of my mind was always this thing about leaving a legacy for myself and for my children. And so in Forte, Michael spoke about my brother. He couldn't talk about it. Uh, I also struggle, but I'll walk through you. Now picture that there's five children, the last one is a favorite of the family, 
and I come from university, I'm in my third year of a BSc degree, and as I get to, into so much, I just see this phrase, and I'm wondering what's happening. Long story short, so into 1976 was happening, and now I'm still thinking, oh, he's going to tell me what is going on, and I tell my friends, you know, Hastings will tell us what's going on, because he's always there in the action. Long story short, the boy had received a bullet about his forehead from the police on the first day of the uprisings, and he had died, and we didn't know that. We looked for him until July. This was 16th of June when he died. We only found his body lying in the mortuary on the 3rd of July. And that is what made me leave South Africa uh, the last year of my university degree, Bachelor of Science. I terminated my studies and I just felt I'm going away and I'm going to fight the system and I'm going to abandon everything. And uh, that led to 18 years of exile, during which was, I went through the military training, then decided at some point that I'm not going to go through with this, I need to get an education, and that's how I went back to the University of Zambia for my BSc and MBCHP. Now, as I conclude my input this afternoon, I just want each and every single one of you, having listened to my story, to sit back and reflect on your own life. And I know I'm kind of being uh, you know, like a priest, but not on normal dose, eh? like a priest <laughs> preaching about stuff. And I just want you to, to sit back and look at your own personal challenges. In South Africa today, each one of us has got a very good excuse why we are underperforming or we are depressed or so-and-so is a problem I'm at the space because, you know, I could have been elsewhere were it not for my immediate supervisor or it not for so-and-so. In South Africa, the tragedy is that this beautiful country which has got such tremendous potential has engulfed all of us in a negative, negative vibe. And individuals in society have ceased to take control of their lives. So I'm challenging each one of you. Go back, get control of your life, determine for yourself what legacy do you want to leave. I climb mountains as, as Michael has said, and it's amazing how as you journey through these mountains, and Maya knows she's also been, maybe she's also a non-exec director, has also been to the top of Kilimanjaro, except she used some crazy route. I used, the, I used the easy route. But as you climb a mountain, and I challenge each one of you, think about your own mountain, physical and spiritual. As you climb the mountain, I mean, you're sitting at the base of Kilimanjaro, and you look at this long, long thing, and you kind of say, Oh my God, how am I going to do this? But you start. You make a start. And each step, each step you take, you get to the base camp. Base camp on day one, you just want to die because you're so exhausted. By the time you get to base camp on day five, because that summit night, you have rekindled your spirit and your determination to get to the top. And so I want to challenge you to sit, do what I ask you to do, Determine for yourself what you want to do. Look at those mountains, physical or emotional, that you might have, and then begin to climb them. And as I step down, Michael says I'm a big brand ambassador of truth. He's right. Like this morning, they asked me, oh, what a beautiful outfit. Where did you get that from? I said, I think I bought it from truth. <laughs> I'm sure you'll find you'll find it. Even my Hemi's belt has become a truest belt. Right? And he's right. I think I, what I believe I've managed to do with my business motel is to, to get our people to buy into the brand. We pride ourselves for being zero tolerance to corruption excellent delivery of our product on time, on budget, and excellent quality. And so all our people, including the cleaner in our business, knows that this is their money. So I, I appeal to you, Truett is a great brand. It's a fantastic brand. Please become brand ambassadors for the brand.
because at the end of the day, this is this is your home. This is this is what's gonna build you. And and I always say to those that I believe are not in for it, I say, well, in any case, if you don't like us so much, can you picture you're gonna be stuck with me for ten, for ten years? Maybe ship out while there's still time, so that uh, you know we can get on with our business. But I'm sure, Michael, that this this crowd that I see before me is determined to carry the brand forward. It's a great brand for great leadership, for a great executive team. I mean, look at them, sexy, young, professional. <laughs> Thank you very much for listening to me. <laughs> say after a woman that that kind of influence. So Tandi, um, really you have as always inspired me and I'm sure looking at the faces around me inspired many and um, I think when you work in retail or in many businesses in South Africa today the mountain that you describe um, feels like sometimes like our daily lives and Michael said it's more of the same it's tough business is tough and that's our mountain, I guess. And so thank you very much for the inspiration that you provided, that vision of the mountain that hopefully we can take away and, and see the pinnacle of the mountain within our sights and know that we must just hike every day with that same conviction in our hearts that Tandi has described and commitment to look after ourselves and our integrity and the integrity of the business that we work in. But Tandi, I also, when I read your book and, and uh, listening to you again today, you truly are a role model of the truest values. And I, I went through them specifically and just looked the passion that Tandi has, not only for the work that she does, but for helping people is evident, as you would have seen today. And then the innovation. The innovation that she's used often to get her herself out of extraordinary difficult circumstances and very, very tough beyond what many of us, I hope, will ever know. Um, that that requirement for innovation comes through in so much that Tandi has done. And she has been extremely modest in, in what she shared with us today, but I can tell you there's great richness in, in her story, way beyond that. And then the willingness to learn. Tandi's always open to listen. She asks the questions, and although I consider her, we consider her an expert in so many things, she always learns, and that's certainly been one of the secrets that I've taken from the success of her business. But then importantly, again, if we reflect on her values, one of the things she's done is she shared that knowledge, her own knowledge and her own education with people around her, particularly the women around her, in order to build them and develop them. And it has been, I think, something that's almost bordered on an obsession. So what she didn't mention to you about the mountain climbing is it was also done to raise money to assist those people to learn and lift themselves out of their own circumstances. And then the building of teams. Tandis again consciously surrounded herself with multidisciplinary teams to draw on that knowledge and to really take her business from strength to strength. And in that, to always include young people in those teams with a specific desire to provide mentorship and growth. And that has developed amazing succession in her businesses. And so as a result of that, I think, Tandy, you, you've really achieved incredible success. I mean, she jokes about the awards, but honestly, it is really quite extraordinary. And I, at a point in time, thought I might list the awards, but honestly, we would still be here next month for Trump. So, and, and the thing is that they're not token awards. These are real awards for real achievements in an extraordinarily competitive environment. And then Tandi is a stylist and a fashionista, unquestionably, and a great wearer of truest clothes, even if she's wearing an Hermes belt today. <laughs> but um, another fashionista said the following, there is something so special about a woman who dominates in a man's world. It takes a certain grace, strength, intelligence and fearlessness, and the nerve to never take no for an answer. And I could put it to the floor to ask you to guess. I don't know if anyone knows who said that, but I was surprised. Because it's very good. Two? Anybody? Rihanna. How about that? 
but Frankie, I think Rihanna described you very, very well, so we can credit her for that. So really, Tandy, just on behalf of everybody here, I really would like to thank you um, very, very sincerely for taking the time today to share just a tiny bit of your extraordinary story and also offering us access to your book, which I highly recommend. You're an inspiration to many, and particularly to, to women in this country. Um, and you've been a tireless champion for positive change, and often in a very difficult and competitive workspace for women. And we're privileged not only to have your wisdom and your commitment to our board, but also to have you as that proud ambassador to Truth. Thank you very, very much.